Well, amen. I want to preach today on Noah and the Ark. Noah and the Ark. What a fun story in the Bible. There's a lot of science there to it. Mrs. Wright, I'm not going to get into all of that, but there's a lot of fun uh, science there. Um, uh, how, and again, there's, I, I've got to go visit the ark, uh, not the, the, the replica, the, <laughs> um, and, and it's, it's astounding. It's, it's amazing. It's a true story. It's not fiction. Uh, it really happened, and that's why you and I are sitting here today, <laughs> all of us. Uh, and so I want to talk about Noah and the ark. Uh, what a fun uh, story. It's a, a sad story. Uh, uh, all but eight people died. Um, surrounding these events. Uh, and there were lots and lots and lots of people on the earth. Some estimate there were billions of people on the earth. Uh, back in those days, they lived a lot longer and, and, and had, uh, I, I imagine, more opportunity to have more children with the longer lifespans and people weren't dying. Methuselah, of course, dies shortly before the, the floodwaters come and he lived to be 969 years old. And some of us, imagine that, 969 years. I'm thinking, Lord, I, I want to be with you long before that. I'm not looking for 969. I want to give me a good full life and let me go to heaven. Uh, <laughs> I want to be with you. But 969 years, what a long time to be down here. But, but anyway, Noah and the ark. Uh, so let's, let's go to Genesis chapter 6. And we'll, we'll talk about this. I'm not going to uh, get into every aspect of it. In fact, next Sunday morning, I want to uh, 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 preach some more on Noah and the ark and draw out a couple uh, more ideas about it. But, but we'll go to Genesis chapter 6, and we'll see that things were pretty rough down here. Do you ever feel like things are rough <laughs> down here? Well, uh, uh, it's not a new thing for things to be rough down here and for man to be drunken on iniquity and filthiness. Um, boy, and the way it describes things uh, in Genesis 6, verse 1. I'm going to kind of jump uh, through some verses, but, but it says in verse 1, it, it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them. So lots and lots of people, verse 5, God saw... And by the way, what he sees is what truly matters. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And again, this description, listen to this, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That's quite the description. Every imagination of the thoughts of his heart's heart only evil continually. Verse 7. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. Verse 8, one of those most blessed words in the Bible, but, one of the most precious words in the Bible, but, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Verse 10, Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So he's got his wife and three sons, and, and eventually they marry. So there's three daughters-in-law. Verse 12, and God looked upon the earth, and it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me. For the earth is filled with violence and through them. Uh, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Verse 14, make thee an ark. So even as he says, I'm going to destroy the wickedness, but I am a merciful God. I'm going to make sure that anyone that cares about me has a way of escape. But I'm going to destroy uh, sin, I'm going to destroy the sinner, but those that will come to me, I will make sure there's a path of escape if they care enough to take it. Verse 14, make thee an ark of gopher. What rooms shalt thou make in the ark? And shall pitch it. 
the idea, the, the, a, a, a tar, they were going to take this tar and waterproof it outside and in, pitch it within and without with pitch. Verse 16, a window shalt thou make in the ark. So that, that's what I want to look at next week. A little bit more about the window in the ark. And in a cubit thou shalt finish it above. And the door. I want to look at the window and the door and maybe a little bit about this pitch next week. But the door and the window, we'll look at that some more next week. Shalt thou set in the side thereof. There'll be a lower, a second, and a third story shalt thou make it. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh. So again, so Noah, what does Noah know now? I need to make a giant boat. There's going to be a flood coming. I, he doesn't know exactly how yet how this flood is going to come, where the water is going to come from. All he has is God's word that water is going to drown everything that hath breath, and only those inside the ark will survive. Wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. Verse 19, and of every living flesh, uh, of, of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort shalt thou bring into the ark to keep them alive within thee. They shall be male and female. Uh, so he was going to bring the animals, a male and a female, onto the ark. Isn't it sad that these animals had more sense than the people to get on the place of safety? And a lot of people said, ah, ah, I'll pass. I've got my thing. I've got my backup. I've got my fail safe. I'll pass. And here were some animals that had more sense than the millions and millions and millions of people that would just laugh when God sends his warnings. Verse 22 Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. By the way, how busy are we according to all God has commanded us? Are we kind of doing some of the things that God wants us to do? Noah, uh, the Bible says, we'll look at it later on in Hebrews, uh, he, he built the ark according to all the specifications. Imagine if he kind of went most of the way building the ark and there were big holes in the side of the hall. Eh, look, I mean, it's basically there. The ark is basically there. I mean, it's lots of wood, lots of efforts. But it wasn't waterproofed and closed and according to all of God's specifications, it would have been a wasted effort. But by faith, he made sure the ark was exactly what God wanted it to be. He did all that God commanded him because he was going to do it to the saving of his house. It matters to do all that God commands you to the saving of your house. Thus did Noah... So I want to talk today about Noah and the ark. The ark being a picture of Christ. And in some ways, Noah himself uh, gives us some fun pictures of Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the chance to look into your precious word. Lord, your, your book is what's precious. Uh, thank you, Lord. What a, what a privilege and an honor that I get to open it before these people. Oh, Lord, I pray that, uh, uh, Lord, that... You would forgive those things in my life, God, uh, that are not pleasing to you. Lord, I, I want to be clean up here so that you can speak through me. These folks need to hear from you. Lord, as we look at the story of Noah and the ark, I pray that you'd open the hearts and the minds, the spiritual eyes of those that are here. Holy Spirit, I pray that you'd speak to hearts. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. So what do we see? We see that men began to multiply on the earth, and they're interested in doing their own thing. Boy, does that sound familiar? Looking at this world around us, I want to do my thing. Uh, welcome to the human race. All of us have been there, and even believers, we still battle with that, don't we? But I want to, no, 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 Lord, I've done my thing enough, and it brings misery. I want to do your thing. That brings fulfillment and peace and joy and happiness. Oh, Lord, I want to do your thing, but it's a constant battle down here. And a lot of people, most people are on that broad path to destruction. I want to do my thing. And that's the world around us. Boy, you, you take the Bible and you walk up to the average person and you say, would you, 
would you be interested in me opening this book and, and telling you what God wants? That would, not only would they be disinterested for the most, uh, most often, but they would be actually frightened. No, no, get, get that away from me. I want to be obligated to knowing what he wants. I want the ability to do what I want to be protected. So they wanted to do their own thing. The, the thoughts of their hearts were only evil continuously. They spent their time either doing evil or imagining that they were doing evil. <laughs> um, I suppose, you know, they would do evil until they were too tired to do more evil. And they would rest up so they could do more evil. And while they're resting, imagining the evil they're going to do as soon as they get the strength back. Uh, how evil things were, were awful. By the way, we have much in common. It says that the, all the, every imagination of the thoughts of their heart. We have the same wicked heart until we're saved and God creates in us a clean heart miraculously through salvation. Jeremiah 17, 9, the, the heart is deceitful above all, above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Um, but here, here's the other thing. God made mankind uh, with a spiritual appetite. We have the need to worship. Uh, and so the needs that God builds into us, often we find counterfeit ways of satisfying. And so religion is no exception. This world around us, they have their false religions that scratch the spiritual itch that God built into us. God gave every person a spiritual itch and the true satisfaction of the need to worship that God built into us is by getting to know the God of this book. But man has lots of counterfeit ways of scratching that spiritual itch. Uh, the first human being to be born, his name was Cain. And uh, uh, God wanted a, a, a blood sacrifice, uh, an animal, an innocent animal that was spotless to picture the, the Lord Jesus Christ to be slain on the altar. And Cain decided, eh, that, that, that religion is not interesting enough to me. That's not beautiful enough to me. I'm going to have an altar, but I'm going to put the work of my hands the, the, the crops that I have grown, I'm going to put those on there instead. I'm going to have this other religion. I'm going to invent approaches to God that satisfy me and that make sense to me. Um, God came to Cain and said, Cain, that's, that's not acceptable. And it was almost like, oh, you thought this was about you? This is about me doing what I want satisfying my need to worship in a way that satisfies me. I've kind of left you out of it. <laughs> Why do you think you matter? Such is the religion in this world around us that does not have Christ at the center of it, trusting in his finished work alone on the cross. The vast majority of the religions that are out there say, do, do, do. And the true religion of God's word says, done. Christ did it on the cross, and we trusted him, and we'll see that in the picture of the ark. Jude only has one chapter. Jude, that second to last book of the Bible, in verse 11, it talks about the way of Cain, the religion of this world that focuses on human merit. The world's religion was fathered by Satan at the tree when he said, you decide what's best for you. You worship any way you feel comfortable worshiping. Don't, don't trust what God says. You do what's best for you. It was fathered by Satan at the tree. And it was furthered by violence when Cain murdered the true worshiper. Abel came to God the right way. And oh, oh, the world is never satisfied with just being in its sin. It needs to go and find the true worshiper and destroy him. The true worshiper bothers them. It convicts them. And they will, they're not satisfied just to go off and enjoy their sin. They're miserable out there. And in their misery they say, who can I destroy that will make me feel better? That first false religion of creative approaches to God. There was Cain and he looks and there's Abel. 
Worshiping God the way he desires to be worshipped. Honoring God. Putting God at the center of things instead of the worshiper. And Cain murdered him. This false religion. How many through the ages have been murdered in the name of false religion? So many. Fathered by the devil at the tree. Furthered by violence. By Cain when he murdered his brother for honoring God. But I have news for you. It's finalized in the lake of fire. This religion leads to hell and then to the lake of fire. Here in Genesis, God decided he was going to judge the great wickedness with a great flood that would destroy everything that breathed. And God is still in the business of judging wickedness. All mankind will stand before God one day. Brother Varner said it. <laughs> he said, I, I, I fear not the great white throne judgment. That's going to be a, what did you do with Jesus? Well, I had this religion. What did you do with Jesus? Well, I, well, I is the wrong answer. Jesus did it. What did you do with what Jesus did? He said, I fear not the great white throne judgment. But I, uh, he said, I'm a poor Christian. I, I'm a little concerned about that judgment seat of Christ. With when the blessings that God has given to me, and what did I do with the riches of salvation and everything that God poured? What did I do with the riches he bestowed upon me in salvation? Everyone is going to stand before God in judgment. He says in Hebrews 9, 27, as it, appoint, as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. But we see here, in verse 8, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. What a precious set of words there. While the vast majority of the population at this time cared only about one thing, what do I want, and just did not care what God wanted, there was someone who did care about what God wanted. Noah. He found grace. Uh, just three things real quickly about Noah finding grace. One, at some point he found out that there was grace he could find. God was good and wanted to pour out that goodness. And, and Noah thought, he, he, he heard, somehow he heard. And faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We're sinners, but there's a good God who wants to give his grace. And Noah said, there's grace. I don't deserve that grace. That's what grace is. It's undeserved favor, undeserved kindness, undeserved mercy, undeserved forgiveness. And he says, I don't deserve it, but there's a God, a good God who's willing to give it. Oh, God up in heaven. I'm listening. Tell me more. First, he knew that there was grace to be had. Secondly, he knew that he needed that grace because he found grace. That must mean he sought for the grace that he found. He knew he needed it. There was a humility that said, I'm a sinner and I need that grace from God. And then thirdly, if he found it, he must have sought after that grace in order to find it. And the Bible says that you and I need to go through those same things. You and I are sinners, but praise God, he offers his grace to us. What does the Bible say in Hebrews 2, 8, and 9? For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Still today, just like in Noah's day, the vast, vast, vast majority of people cared not for the grace of God, even though to some degree every breath they drew was the grace of God. There are so many that don't care, but praise God, there are some that do. Praise God, there are some that thank God for his grace. We need the grace of God uh, even though so many act like it doesn't matter. We need God, all of us. So Noah, is Noah in heaven today because he built an ark? The answer is no. It's because he found grace. 
in the eyes of the Lord. But then God used this believer to build an ark because God wanted a, a pathway through the judgment that people could enjoy if they would just trust in the pathway. So God was going to have Noah build a gigantic boat. <laughs> um, and, and so there was going to be a flood that was going to cover all land across the entire earth. Everything and every one that breathed air was going to drown. Uh, except for the ones that were going to be on this ark. Noah, again, you think of the, uh, of the, the 120 years or so that he took to build the ark. Guess what his name means? Noah, guess what his name means? Rest. Rest. You're like, what a funny name for a guy that had to work so hard to build that ark. But I think there's a, a, a beauty there. I even think, I, I was looking at the song, The Haven of Rest. The haven of rest and uh, the efforts that, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, the rest that we find, even in working for the Lord, you find rest. What does the Bible say here in, in Matthew 11, 28 through 30? Come unto me. And that reminds us of Noah too, doesn't it? When Noah built the ark, the Lord Jesus in the ark said, come. Here Jesus says, come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke. So take my work upon you. Rest in working with and for the Lord Jesus. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden. There is a burden that comes with salvation, but it's a good one. It's a good one, like a mom that has a little baby. There's a burden there, the responsibility of caring for that. Oh, it's not a burden. I, I love that child. Oh, so it doesn't seem like a burden because of how much you love that child? Oh, and when you work for Christ, there's no burden there, even though there's a burden, a responsibility. My burden is light. Oh, it doesn't seem like a burden when I'm doing what God wants me to do. I can spend my time building an ark if it means I can save my home. I love my home. And doing right doesn't seem like a burden to me. My burden is light. Noah began preaching about the coming judgment. The Bible says in 2 Peter 2, 5, calls him a preacher of righteousness. He began warning. Even the, the ark itself was a gigantic warning, wasn't it? You look at the gigantic ark, and word is going to spread. What are you doing, Noah? I'm building a gigantic boat. Why? Because only the people inside this boat are going to survive the coming floods. The, the ark itself was a gigantic object lesson that judgment was coming. Noah began building a vehicle of safety that would provide salvation from the coming judgment. Those in the ark would make it safely through the judgment and come out on the other side. Last week we kind of talked about Moses a little bit and, and there was the Nile in Exodus. They would, they would throw babies in the Nile to drown them to death. And Moses' mother made an ark of bulrushes, the Bible says in Exodus 2, verse 3. She placed him in this little ark and she daubed it within and without with slime and, and made it waterproof. You know, kids like slime anyway, so they had a little bit of slime to play with there. But she put him in there and put it in the, the, the Nile River where others were dying. She made a vehicle of safety where her child could be there where others were dying. But because of that ark, the child would be safe from that death. And so jo uh, Noah was given a job and he got to it. An obedient father. He not only was, was, was preaching to the lost, but you better believe his children were looking and saying, my dad takes what God has to say seriously. Dads, are you like a Noah? Do your children say, wow, my dad takes the warnings of God seriously? Are your sons, are your daughters watching you take the warnings of God seriously? Noah's children watched him. God said it. And it means it's going to happen. And I'm going to build my life around the words of God. I'm going to build my life around the warnings of God. I'm going to build my life around the ways.
things of God because what he says is true. His children watched him practice God's word like it meant something. Dads, we got to get busy because a lot of times we're kind of, we get cold and we kind of play at this Christianity thing and we're not as serious as we ought to be. Noah built this ark. Uh, Their whole lives were going to be built around the preparation for the coming judgment and consequently his sons and their daughters were saved. Not like Lot who played at being a believer and lost his children when the judgment came. There's a work for Jesus ready at your hand. Tis the task the master just for you has planned. Haste to do his bidding. Yield him service true. There's a work for Jesus none else but you can do. So we have this Old Testament carpenter who got busy preparing a way of safety. This antediluvian. Again, wow, that's a big word, right? It's it's Mr. Varner. You know, he's talking about Avarice is insidious and obsequious. You're like, oh, wow, chew on that. Um, This antediluvian, pre-flood carpenter. Isn't it a beautiful thing that that we have this carpenter in the Old Testament building a, a way of, a path of safety and God used a carpenter in the New Testament. Jesus born into the home of a carpenter who would die on a wooden cross Noah was just a picture. The ark was just a picture of the true salvation, the true New Testament carpenter that God up in heaven would use to provide the real path of safety through the coming judgment, the Lord Jesus Christ. John 3.36 says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. So he got busy building the ark. Again, sometimes we lose sight of how big the ark was. 300 cubits long, uh, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. Uh, A a cubit is thought to be somewhere around 18 inches. So So we're talking 450 feet long. That's, am I I thinking right? That's like a football field and a half? Uh, A football field and a half. That's a big boat. That's a big boat. This is a big room. And it doesn't come close to holding the ark. He got very, very busy. (laughs) Um, uh, Somebody said, boy, it's the same ratios as a coffin. And it would have been, uh, in many ways, like a a box. A coffin. uh, Can you hear the people... Mocking uh, Noah. Undoubtedly, they would, they would make fun of him. Uh, Noah, so you're building a giant coffin. What's it for? It's a boat, a giant boat. A flood is coming, and only those inside my boat are going to survive. You're welcome to come. How much are you going to charge? Nothing. You just have to have enough faith to climb aboard. Leave the other things you're trusting in this life to bring you fulfillment and meaning and trust this instead. Well, that's a picture of repentance, isn't it? Leave what you were trusting and climb aboard this instead. Free? I don't place much stock in something I didn't earn. Well, in in this case, you're going to have to entirely trust in the efforts of another. But it's your only hope. What do you say? How many takers you got so far? Just my family. But there's room for you. Are you in? Nah, Uh, We we got boats. 
uh, down, down by the water. We, we got boats. We, have, we, we, we can, I mean, you're, you're the crazy one. Your, your boat isn't even near the water, but, but we, we, we got our boats. No, those won't survive. <sighs> Maybe I'll just buy some stock in an umbrella company. Noah, I don't need this. So you and your giant coffin, you can do your own thing. Besides, Noah, coffins are for dead people. Not this one. It's backwards with this one. Those inside this coffin are going to be the only ones that are alive. Those outside of it are going to die. I guess you could say it's a picture of life brought through a vehicle of death. And really, that's what salvation is. You and I were dead. Those outside of that coffin were as good as dead. They were only going to find life by going inside. And you and I were dead. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, 1, You hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. We find life through his death. We find life through his death and what he did on the cross. That's what's pictured in baptism. When we stand up there and we go beneath the water, the instrument of death, we die beneath water. We're buried in an instrument of death and we identify with the death of Christ. We identify with what he did for us and we're buried and we come out in newness of life. We were dead, but Jesus died in our place. The Bible says in Romans 5, 8, but God commendeth, he proved his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us in our place. And in Christ we find salvation. In Christ, climbing aboard, trusting in him, forgetting those other things we trusted in and climbing aboard the Lord Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, therefore if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, behold, all things are become new. So in Genesis chapter 7, verse 1, the day came. And the Lord said unto Noah, Come, come thou and all thy house into the ark. For thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. And by the way, another glimpse into God's mercy, it was a week they were in there for a week before the storms came and the door was shut. Oh, how merciful God is. But there comes a time when the door is shut, never to be open again. Verse 15. And they went in unto Noah, into the ark, two and two of all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. And they that went in went in male and female of all flesh as God had commanded him. And the Lord shut him in. The Lord shut him in. He was in safety. Safety that the Lord provided. The Lord shut him in, sealed him in unto the day of redemption on the other side of the judgment. And the flood was 40 days upon the earth and the waters increased and bare up the ark and it was lift up above the earth and the waters prevailed and were increased greatly upon the earth and the ark went upon the face of the waters and the waters prevailed exceedingly above the earth and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. 15 feet upward did the waters prevail and the mountains were covered and all flesh died. Every human that died chose to die. All flesh die, died, and there was no need to, except they chose not to take God's path, God's vehicle, God's instrument of safety. All flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of fowl and of cattle and of beast and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth and every man, all in whose nostrils was the breath of life of all that was in dry land, died. I wonder, I wonder 
if there were people at the door of the, the ark crying out, No, I changed my mind. Open the door. It's not up to me. God shut the door. No, you were the one. Remember, I, 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 I pondered it. I almost believed you. It's too late. God shut the door and there's nothing I can do. I was the one you hired to bring you the, the gopher wood. We are business partners. It doesn't matter. You're not inside. And God has shut the door. I was your neighbor. Sure, I, I laughed at you day by day as you went to the work. But I'm ready to be serious now. I'm ready to be serious now. I can't open the door. The Lord has shut us in. The time of grace has passed. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord while it was available. But there came a time when it was no longer available. These had their day of grace, but the time had passed. Would you close your eyes and bow your heads? Think about these words, would you? 